our text this morning for the message is the uh, Old Testament reading in Isaiah 43. I want to return you for a moment back to verse 1. It says there, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. This is our text. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I heard this about being called by name, I was reminded of uh, my father. When I was a little boy, all the kids in the neighborhood had gotten uh, uh, into the habit of calling each other by their last names, which was a little weird, I guess, thinking back on it, but that's what they did. I suppose that people have done that from time to time, but all these, I mean, we're all just little boys. So uh, one day my father heard them doing that, that calling me by my name, my last name, uh, and he thought that that was disrespectful. So he called me aside and he says, that's not happening anymore. They're not allowed to call you that, it's disrespectful. Uh, um, so he said, no more last name. They can call you sir, they can call you Mr. Moore, they can call you uh, Don, they can call you Donnie, but no more, just more. Uh, and, and, you know, as it turned out, I mean, that was the end of his worry about it, but uh, the kids in the neighborhood were concerned because they caught some of that, and I had to bring them up to speed. And, uh, and what they ended up with is a, a, a compromise. They started calling me Mordecai. Was, uh, then that was way weirder. I would have been happier if they just stuck with what they were doing. But my father being what he is, he claimed his name and he wasn't letting it go. Okay, fine. So here we are, uh, Israel's people. Uh, they're, they're called Israel. They're called Judah. Here he calls them Jacob also. Uh, they're, they're having trouble because they were not acting like God uh, had called them out of Egypt and slavery. It had been a while. I mean, at the point when Isaiah is talking, they're already uh, looking at exile in Babylon. They haven't gone yet, but Assyria had come down and, and hammered uh, northern Israel pretty badly. Uh, and there was this great threat upon uh, Babylon. And, and Isaiah had told them that that was what was coming. Um, but at the same time, you get messages like this. Uh, he, he claims them here. God claims them here. He says, you're mine, which sounds a little selfish. I, for some reason, you know, as we sit here and I hear that, I say, well, yeah, that's a good thing. But uh, I can imagine somebody not thinking that way. And, um, well, I mean, in being conquered and enslaved and exiled or whatever, he, he claims them. They're his. It doesn't seem like he's acting like He's claimed them that like they're his, but uh, he uh, he says he is with them. He says no matter no matter what the circumstances. He says what is happening, uh, whatever it is, they will not be destroyed. They will not be drowned. They will not be burned up. They're his. <coughs> if only they could act like that instead of pretending that they were not his. Well, actually, they were thinking that they were his, and he would take care of them no matter what they were doing, which is not particularly. Wise. Uh, so uh, this is different for us, I guess. Uh, we are his. You are his. You're not being conquered or enslaved by nations or peoples that surround you. But circumstances arise from sin and, and all of this enslavement discussion and bondage. It's all about sin one way or another and God demonstrating how he treats with that. But you are dealing with uh, sin in your life one way or another. Yours, others, uh, the corruption of, of nature as the world exists, uh, the, the things happen to you. Uh, you are often enough in distress of some kind or other. I think you all understand what I mean by that. So is God telling stories about him always being with you? Uh, sometimes it just doesn't look like he's there, like he's not paying attention. Uh, can we just do what he said 
And uh, boy, this is a noisy mic. I'm going to turn it off. Are we still okay? All right. Um, he says there that you are his, but can we just uh, accept that all of the hardships that happen to us, uh, that those are discipline from a loving father? That's what Hebrews 2 says. Uh, you're familiar with suffering in so many ways. How, how can God be watching over you in the, in the middle of hardship? Because he could just stop it if you're his if you're his child, uh, he could just put an end to it. He has the power to do that. So you, you have to know that if you're suffering, he is given permission for such things to happen. And it's kind of horrible to think of him that way. Uh, does a loving father, a loving God withhold his mercy like that? It's difficult. You may not see what your heavenly father is up to all the time, which is unfortunately uh, one of the explanations for the problem of him letting such things go. But, but even though all people's experience, all of those things, every hardship, every horror of life, he says you belong to him in all things, all things, every circumstance, every walk, every possible thing that could happen to you you are his. You've been baptized with Christ. And Paul had some things to say about that today. Uh, you died with him to destroy your uh, sin in his blood. As he goes to the cross, all of your sin, everything about you that is sinful goes to the cross with him and he kills it there. It can no longer enslave you or bind you to death or condemnation because it's been taken from you. So even in all these circumstances, whether it belongs to your own sin or someone else sinning against you or whatever the circumstances, you have died with Christ and sin no longer binds you. And even more so, as you've been baptized, Paul says that Christ has risen, which we know. And as he rises, you have risen with him in that same water of baptism. You are alive in Christ. That has happened to you. As Christ lives, you live. As for your life on earth, there are troubles. Always. They're not going to stop. There's just going to be one or another. They come and they come and they come. And it's very difficult. But God has promised that those hardships will not destroy you. No matter what they are, no matter how much power comes against you, even death cannot harm you or overwhelm you, nor will you endure them alone. He will be with you. He has promised for you eternal life. God himself said that this is so because of what Christ has done for you. You will live forever. The inheritance that you have has begun already in the blood of his own son. He will not take anything from you. He will not withhold anything from you. But what would he withhold if he gives the blood of his son? If the life of his son is the most valuable thing that you know, and you know that it is, he gives it for you just to have you. This is a very powerful thing. What would he withhold? And I think you know the answer is nothing. He says here in Isaiah's mouth some very important things. You are precious to him, he says. It's hard even to imagine that. I mean, we all know ourselves and, and we all know the circumstances of our lives and the sins that we have done. And sometimes we don't even know all of them. And they, then they go and they persist and they're there. But you are precious to him. You are honored. Of course, you are honored. In your baptism, he's given you his son, and you live. He says he loves you. It's astonishing that he would say such a thing, but he says it right out in the open. He loves you. Again, the evidence is what he's done with his son. Nothing can ever take you, uh, take you from his hand. He has called you by name. It says that here. He knows your name. 
He has called your name to himself forever. It has happened. It is already done. And not only that, but in your baptism, he has given his own name to you. Is when, if you recall, you were baptized. Some of you probably don't remember those moments. But when you were baptized, you were baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. His name is upon you. You know, uh, in families, just like uh, my father was fussing about names, uh, your, your last name, uh, that's the way our culture functions uh, these days, is, is your family identity. That's not the same everywhere. Everybody's got different customs that way. In, in uh, Isaiah's time, they didn't have last names. Uh, you were Jacob, son of Isaac, or something to that effect. Uh, but you were identified, in, in, even then, by your father's name. Of course, there, like I said, there are other traditions. But something has happened to you as well. For you, because of what Christ has done, because of your baptism, uh, Jesus has made you his father's family. You've been adopted to it. He set his name on you. I, I don't know, uh, I mean, we call ourselves Christian and Christ's name is there, but it's more than that. Not only do you have Christ's name, you have the name of the entire Trinity on you. When, when you face God in judgment, he will see the mark of your baptism there. And he will know that his name is upon you, that he chose you, that he called you by name, and that he has called you by his name. And this is so. This is promise. And it is your salvation in Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.